I wonder if you've ever felt trapped. Uh, I was 13, and uh, as was Ozzy. Ozzy lived round the corner from me and lived in a nice house uh, with a flat roof, uh, which uh, after the, the war, a wartime bombing raid, uh, the owner came back in from the shelter in the garden and opened his wardrobe to get ready for work and found an unexploded bomb in the wardrobe. This is one of the things about the house that Ozzy lived in that I remember. On this particular day, Ozzy and I had gone to our den on the heath. We dug into the side of a trench that the council had dug to keep travellers off the heath. Um, and uh, now before anybody starts to tell me, and I can hear it coming already, you know, that's not a very good idea. And I've told you, you're all adults, all right? The children don't need to know about this. Because uh, digging trenches into, uh, or a hole from a trench, it really is not a good idea. Because the hole was dug very simply, very easily. Because this was sand. Basically, it was heathland, and we could dig uh, very easily. It made the den incredibly unstable, and on this day, I was in the den. Ozzy was disposing of debris, uh, as we did, uh, when a gang of older boys appeared with a dog. Now, it wasn't just any dog, it was the XL bully of the 1970s. It was an Alsatian. And uh, the dog was pushed into the den. I was trapped. The lads put the old car wheel that we had kept there to hide our den, rolled it across the front of the opening, and then started jumping on the top of the den. And the dog and I were trapped. And Ozzy was gone. I have to say, I was pretty alarmed by this. Uh, I couldn't get out. I already was petrified of dogs. Uh, anything that stood higher than my ankle, and in actual fact, ones that didn't were just as bad. And the roof was shuddering with every jump. Fortunately, the dog didn't savage me. Perhaps more fortunately, I didn't savage the dog either. And the older boys eventually gave up and took the dog away. When I got out, there was no sign of Ozzy, no sign of the boys, no sign of the Alsatian, and if I'm honest, very little sign of any self-respect for myself. If I'd had a mobile, I'd probably have raised the alarm and rung the police, but we didn't. Think, or we didn't think that phones could work without being attached by a piece of wire to the wall, let alone being able to walk over the heath with them. My dignity was shattered and I cried. Anger, frustration, embarrassment. I was in a very heightened state of alarm. Perhaps you've known something like that or maybe your situation currently leads you to a sense of alarm. Well, it's taken us six months to get to this point. I checked, I preached on Mark chapter 1, verses 14 to 18, which is the first bit that I did in Mark's Gospel, the opening series, on Sunday the 28th of January. And it's the 28th of July, six months later. I still find it amazing that I have the privilege of standing here in front of you and sharing from God's word on such a regular basis. And I can only hope and pray that as I stand here and open my mouth that you will hear God's voice speaking to you. I, I'm not really actually bothered about you hearing my voice and if I'm honest, when I hear my own recordings, I can't bear my voice, I never have done. Um, and I don't you know, really want you to appreciate my preaching, what I want you to do is that when you leave this place week after week, that you will have encountered God. That's what my prayer is. Don't be alarmed. They're the, uh, the, the words that stick out to me from this 
final few verses. A few verses which cover 11, sorry, 12 hours probably of time, uh, 12 very significant hours. And we're here as we read it in the garden. It, it's Sunday, the day after the Sabbath. But I think as I've tried to do, as we've read Mark's Gospel, I want, you, want us to think actually about what Mark's written. Because at the beginning of this passage, um, I've just read, I haven't read the passage, have I? I've not read it. We'll read it. Let's read, let's read it. I'll read it from, um, it's not on the, it won't be on the screen, but it is Mark uh, chapter 16, verses 1 to 8. Let's, let's read it together as I make the point about actually reading the words that are in front of us. So Mark chap chapter 16, verses 1 to 8. And it, and it goes like this. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. As we read that, I hope you noticed what was actually said at the beginning. Mark says, when the Sabbath was over, the women went and bought spices needed for the embalming. We need a timeline, probably, for this passage. And the timeline uh, will take us from sort of Saturday, the Sabbath, but just after sunset. Because the Sabbath ended at sunset, as it had started at sunset on the Friday. It's, it finishes at sunset on the Saturday. And they had gone to find what they needed. They're ready for the morning. They have got the oils, the spices that they need to anoint Jesus' body. The timeline is important because if we go back to chapter 10, we read this. They were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way and the disciples were astonished while those who followed were afraid again he took the twelve aside and told them what was going to happen to him we are going up to Jerusalem he said and the son of man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law they will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him flog him and kill him three days later he will rise. They were on the journey up to Jerusalem. Jesus explains it again to them. He explains this is not going to be a normal trip. The Son of Man is going to be handed over to the chief priests and teachers of the law. He will be killed and three days later he will rise. They didn't get it. They didn't remember a week later when it was happening. They didn't uh, remember when he was tried and mocked and spat on and now three days later they haven't remembered that bit either. Hindsight as they say is a wonderful thing. Peter clearly remembered it well enough to include in his memoirs for Mark to write down. So here we are in this passage it's Sunday the third day. Jesus was arrested on Thursday night, day zero. There was a problem. If you were here, we talked about 20 hours where they uh, had to get everything done, the Jewish leaders, in 20 hours before Passover Sabbath started. 
even if they could have got away with work on a usual Sabbath, there's no way with the city heaving with the celebration of Passover that the religious leaders can be seen to be bending the obvious rules. As we thought about the other week, they need to work fast. The kangaroo court of the religious leaders and Pilate worked through the night to eventually arrive at the decision made with the crowd that had arrived independently to request the, the Passover release that Pilate had sort of set in place that Jesus should be crucified and Barabbas released. They've moved overnight into day one. Jesus is taken from the courts of Pilate by soldiers he was dressed in a purple robe, crown of thorns, beaten, spat on, mocked, before being led out in his own clothes and taken to Golgotha, the place of a skull. He was stripped, nailed to the cross. The cross was raised and gravity took hold, trying to rip his body from the cross. Three hours later at noon, with the sun at his highest point, a supernatural darkness fell for three hours. I wonder, did they recall the, the stories of the days before the Exodus, the ninth plague of darkness, when the Egyptians were unable to see their hands in front of their faces? Now it's Jerusalem that's plunged into darkness. Are the Jews able to see anything in it? We don't know. Did they remember then the tenth plague, the angel of death taking the firstborn? And by 3 p.m.? God's firstborn, God's son, is dead. The darkness was lifted. Jesus was placed in a tomb. Day one is done and the religious leaders must have, sighed, must have breathed a massive sigh of relief. Sabbath, day two, would have involved the usual routine of meals and so on that they would have had in place. But it would have been fairly quiet. Jesus is lying in the tomb. The disciples are keeping their heads down. Would the authorities be coming for them next? And as the sun set, the women go out. They, they haven't had time on day one, had they? Jesus needed embalming. They, need, they return with all that they need. And day two comes to an end. And as the sun rises, day three, just another day, begins and the women leave they, they have a job to do Jesus might well have said that the nard perfume that was poured over his head was preparation for death but they needed to get to his body they they needed to do things right but how would they get in the tomb they, we we read didn't we that they said to each other who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb guard there would the, yeah would they let them even would, would the guards help perhaps you could imagine a conversation running through their heads is certainly how my head works i wonder whether the guards would have responded you know that you sort of think don't you well if i say this will they say that and perhaps the words that they're thinking from the guards might go something like no way we've been told to let no one in we know who you are, but no one. Yes, the darkness was startling, but that doesn't change our orders. Why would you want to go in? Don't you realise that there will be a stink by now? At least the stone keeps the smell away. No, I've got a wife and kids. No, I need this job. Well, maybe. Just for a few minutes. But, but don't tell anyone. I mean, what a waste of mental energy to try and think about all those conversations. Because as they arrive, they find the tomb. And as they look, probably with tears streaming down their face as they come to the grave, the tomb of their beloved friend, I wonder if they questioned whether they were in the right place. Hadn't the tomb been sealed? But there it was. The stone was rolled away. The tomb was no longer sealed. Now put yourself in their position just for a moment. What is going on? 
Who's responsible for this? What are the authorities up to? Or is it the Romans? Is anyone watching us? Are we just about to be arrested? Or worse? What to do? Do we go back? Or do we go in? Was it a trap? What if, as they go in, somebody rolls the stone back in front of the entrance and they're trapped? Do they go forward or do they go back? They've come this far. They went in. And there in the tomb, sat down was a young man dressed in white and Mark tells us that they were alarmed it's actually quite easy for us to think oh it's quite easy we walked in big cave oh there's a man sat there that's great but actually Mark says that this was alarming this was scary for them it's The same word I used, wasn't it, about being trapped with the Alsatian. And maybe you're made of stronger stuff than me, but I'm pretty sure that I'd have been alarmed if I'd gone into a tomb where I'd expected to find a dead body in the early stages of decay and found a young man sat there as right as rain. I don't think my brain would have been able to process the scene and verbalise any coherent conclusions Certainly at any speed. Who is he? Where's Jesus' body? Who's moved the stone? Is this someone we can trust? Oh, why Oh, why did he have to die? What's going on? Don't be alarmed. <coughs> well, that's okay for you to say. But what am I meant to be then? I mean, it's hardly every day that you go to a tomb and find the massive stone stopper rolled away before you get there, find the resident of the tomb gone and find a fit and healthy young man waiting for a chat. There must have been so many possibilities running through their minds in those few seconds. Now, I openly admit they are women. Therefore, before anybody says anything, therefore they are far more likely to have been logical and quite possibly less extreme than me. I accept that. But here are a few possibilities. They've interrupted a grave robber. After all, the citation had read, King of the Jews, perhaps they thought there might be some riches to plunder. But why does the young man just sit there and not run? Also, he's got a white robe, which is fairly distinctive in terms of being recognised. And the body, or rather the lack of it, doesn't seem to go with grave robber. Maybe the authorities have removed the body. Without doubt, they had been worried about Jesus. Joseph, who buried Jesus, had rather taken control at the end, hadn't he? Uh, So removing and possibly hiding the body could stop a cult of the undead martyr type thing happening when they simply reproduced his body but once again the young man why is why is he there why hasn't he just gone maybe it was the romans or maybe joseph changed his mind about the tomb and had had him reburied (coughs) they even in the right place perhaps they're wondering mark uses a word that suggests that this young man is uh in in the prime of life. Now, when you and I read Scripture, we we have no choice but to read it with a degree of hindsight. I'm not sure uh, that um, any one of us... Sorry, I'll read that again. I'm sure not one of us listened to the passage being read and said to ourselves, any second now, they'll meet the angel. And the angel will reassure them. You know, not one of the translations of Mark 16, verse 5, that is on Bible Hub, which is a really nice online tool which you put in a Bible verse and it gives you every English translation of uh, that verse. Not one English translation in Mark 
16 verse 5 refers to that young man as an angel. They all say he was a young man in the prime of life. So this is a bit, still a bit odd what's happening here. But you know, our experience of the word, our experience of how God works, tells us that this is an angel, doesn't it? In exploring Mark's gospel, I hope I've helped us to look at the text that Mark wrote to make us think occasionally, perhaps going back to the Greek. Mark wrote Peter's memoirs under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. If the word used is that of a young man who is in the prime of life, let's us remove the sort of glowing fire-eyed uh, image of an angel that perhaps we've had as we read it and see a man dressed perhaps unconventionally but a man who greets these grief-stricken women who have come to fulfil the now belated duty of embalming their beloved friend. And the young man says, don't be alarmed, you are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He knows, doesn't he? He, he knows why they're there. He knows what has happened. He, he knows that Jesus, he knows that Jesus is risen. Risen. What, what's Mark trying to convey there? The word he uses for risen is the one that Matthew uses in Matthew uh, 24 verse 7 when he quotes Jesus saying, nation will rise against nation. It's the word that John uses in chapter 2 verses 19 and 20 when Jesus speaks about the temple being destroyed and that he will raise it up again in three days. It's the word used by Paul in Romans 13 when he speaks of knowing the times as, as it is the time to wake up from slumber. This is a strong and powerful word that Mark includes here at the end of his gospel. Jesus was crucified, is now risen, raised up, no longer held down. And pointing to the stone table where Jesus' body had been laid out, to the place where they expected to see their friend, the place they expected to be performing their duty. He says, he has gone. Jesus, who should have been laying there, wrapped in a linen shroud, decaying, in need of the oils and spices to delay that deterioration, held down by the force of gravity in, on his lifeless corpse, is not there. And the messenger then goes on. Go. This final section is still one of those ethos, those immediately action type sequences in Mark's gospel. Go. Go tell the men. Go tell Peter. Tell them that Jesus has returned to Galilee, to the place of so much of his earthly ministry, to the shore of the lake, to the bustling towns, away from the city to Capernaum, to Peter's home, to the home with the, the flat roof and the stairs up the outside. And oh, have they repaired the hole in the roof yet? Maybe they have, maybe they haven't. To the lake with the tax paying fish and the storm that blew up and was settled at his word. To the hillside where thousands could hear him teach. To the place of provision where five loaves and two fish became a banquet for thousands. Go to Galilee and he will meet them there. He's explained it all to them. Go, go on. And the women, we're told, were no longer alarmed. They were terrified, bewildered. So much so that they fled from the tomb and said nothing because they were afraid. And that's where Mark's gospel stops. Well, the English translations contain a few more verses, but the NIV has this warning. The earliest manuscripts and some other ancient witnesses do not have verses 9 to 20. So we'll stop at this point. Maybe you've read the gospels time and time again and understand that this is how Mark finishes. Or maybe you've never noticed the abruptness. 
Perhaps this is the first time you've read it and heard it spoken on. And we're not expecting just an unfinishedness to the story, a, a less than happy ending. Perhaps life is throwing all sorts, or just one sort, at you that leaves you alarmed or terrified or bewildered or afraid or all of them. Go to Galilee. Go to the place where you walked with Jesus before. Maybe it's work, maybe your health or your family. Perhaps it's relationships or finances. Maybe you've lost hope, lost confidence, feel unloved. If you have had enough of this world and life, come to Galilee. Come with us and meet the one who heals the sick, raises the dead to life, gives us purpose, demonstrates God's awesome and amazing love for us, by dying the most awful of deaths, to put us right with our Creator, to give us purpose, to give us life, to give us hope. In a world where we perhaps seem to have so little control, where we perhaps dread tomorrow's financial statement from the government, where Russia sacrifices tens of thousands of men to gain a foothold in eastern Ukraine, where the promised land is a land of conflict and not peace, where the fight for the leadership of the one Western superpower seems just that, a fight near civil war, where we may be alarmed and terrified and bewildered and afraid. The angel says, go and meet with Jesus. Go and walk with Jesus where heaven met earth. Go and walk with the one who at his baptism God spoke over saying, you are my son whom I love, with you I am well pleased. And then at the transfiguration, again God said, this is my son whom I love, listen to him. Wherever, whatever is alarming you, whatever terrifies you, if you are bewildered or are afraid, come and walk with Jesus. And that actually is a serious and heartfelt invitation. We're going to return to Mark's Gospel in the autumn. We're going to run a Christianity Explored course on Wednesday evenings through October and November where we will return to this gospel that we've spent the last six months in and we'll return to walk with Jesus. Put it in your diary, invite your friends, be here. Because I can't give you anything that will solve life's problems other than to say that walking with Jesus gives you the hope of heaven and that calms all the storms that alarm and terrify and bewilder and cause us to be afraid. Come and walk with him. And if you've never done that before, well, don't leave this morning without talking to myself or Mary or Paul or Dave or Sue or any one of the many of us who are followers of Jesus because we'd love to speak to you about how you can turn from the life you've been living, repent of living your own way and ask God to fill you with the Holy Spirit so that you can walk in step with Jesus. And the women left and didn't say anything. And as they were soon though to find out, there is hope in Jesus. Don't be like the women overwhelmed by life and do and say nothing. Let's go to Galilee and walk together with Jesus. We're going to sing now our final hymn. If Mary's long enough to get up to the front, I'll read the first verse for us. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to his. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing all is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Let's stand.